Barry Hill is a New York-based painter who thinks deeply about relationship between the eye and the mind, how meaning is produced by looking, bringing together various art historical conventions with a uniquely contemporary sensibility Barry Hill's highly chromatic images occupy the space between recognition and total abstraction. All the while, he maintains a commitment to the materiality of painting. Carrie Moyer, who joined us as a visiting artist last year, justly described him as having a most delicious way with paint. Barry Hill received his MFA from Columbia University and his BFA in painting from the University of Texas at Austin. He attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and the Marie Walsh Sharp Art Foundation Studio Program. He also was the recipient of the New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Painting. His work has been included in exhibitions in Los Angeles, Berlin, Austin, New York City, among others. Please join me in welcoming Michael Berryhill. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me. And um, all right, let's talk about some art. This is a studio uh, shot of just a wall of drawings. I'm not going to show a lot of drawings. But um, this is kind of always going on at some, in some corner of my studio, just like uh, a wall of current um, inventions, doodles, there's like a constant side practice to painting and it's where every painting kind of comes from. Not every painting has a drawing, but most of them have several. So if I find a, a pathway into a painting that doesn't have one, it's the outlier. And so at any given time, I'll have like a cluster somewhere in my studio of these to kind of like just notice as I walk by. It's not in the painting room, but it's always visible during the day. And in solidarity with uh, some of the grad students I visited today, this is work that I call like secret work. Like it, I make sculpture every once in a while. And I, I don't consider them, I don't know what they are. I don't, I don't show them often. Um, but they're experiments. They're, uh, they're the types of things that end up in my paintings, but they're not the paintings, I think, one of the interesting things I like about them is the backside, you know, because it's like a, a complete unknown. Like, I don't know what it's going to look like. So I'm making the thing frontally, like I would a drawing or a painting. And then just by inventing the thing, uh, the backside's always the, the reveal, the surprise. And I, I talked a lot about that today in people's studios, like always trying to surprise yourself, always trying to kind of have a moment of like, how did, what is that? How did I do that? Where did that come from? And it kind of can lead into other work. Also, I'm gonna say, uh, I know we don't know each other, but if you have a question while we're talking, um, just yell it out. I don't know if you ordinarily do that, but if it occurs to you, you can just yell it out and I'll, uh, I'll just answer you. Um, I'm gonna talk about origin stories here, the embarrassing truth of uh, where the idea of making art came from for me. And I think it's pretty common, with, you know, I was born in 1972, and uh, it's always dudes. Like, I've never met a, a woman who, a female artist, who's like, yeah, it was, it was Star Wars for me. Like, that's, where I, that's how I started making art. But for me, it was Star Wars, and I have to admit it, like, I think it's predictable, it's embarrassing, it's like really pedestrian in a way, because it's like, uh, it's pretty ordinary, but the thing about Star Wars that was different from other films, I was five years old, I saw it in the theater, and uh, I, I was, of course, obsessed with uh, space movies and sci-fi, but Star Wars was the first film where space was dirty, like a spaceship could be banged up, it could be rusty, and uh, that was a level of detail that made me, it was just, I noticed it, and I just wanted, something about that detail made me want to own it, so I started doing drawings of things from Star Wars, because it was a detailed world, it was a world that I could add to. And I grew up in El Paso, Texas, and a car was down the street from my house that was this model car, it wasn't like this, it was on blocks, it was a piece of garbage, it was rusted, and uh, it was a lot like this. It was just fantasy. It was sitting on cinder blocks 
And it required, you know, the imagination to, every day you saw it and you thought about how fast it was, what it sounded like. I mean, it was, it might as well have been a, a spaceship. And the other thing that occurred to me, pretty soon after that, I'm gonna get off Star Wars in a minute, don't worry. But the other thing that occurred to me was the Millennium Falcon, this ship here, was like, like I think Star Wars is not a good movie. Don't get me wrong, it's not good. But what it did for me as a kid is it, it awoke like some kind of critical eye or um, it was a dialogue where I, I was thinking about the thing I'd just seen and thinking more about it than I even knew that the person who made it thought about it, if that makes sense. So like this ship, it occurred to me was a human hand, you know, like the thumb is the cockpit or whatever. And when you're a kid and you don't have a toy or whatever, you're just like playing with your hand, whether it's outside of a car window or just flying around your house. And it was that kind of relationship, like, oh yeah, a spaceship is like a hand and a hand can then become a spaceship. I don't even know if it's true. I've never heard George Lucas say that. But it's something that I thought, like, I gave myself a little credit. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I think I, I, think I stumbled onto something there. So that was all that fed into, like, um, drawing, like just drawing as a kid. So credit where credit's due. Terrible movie, but really good. My other main influence, I'm a, I'm a good lapsed Catholic. And uh, Christian imagery, like specifically Catholic churches and imagery produced for the church, by the church, about the church, was huge. And I bring these up because these tie into the way I still think of art, how strange it is. This is Lucas Cranach, crucifixion painting, obviously. But there's like a post-mortem um, erection on Jesus. And it's like... I think, and there's this one, also Lucas Cranach, and there's another large phallus on a crucified Christ. These are really weird. Like, these aren't some outsider, you know, buddy of Lucas Cranach. Like, these were sanctioned paintings, and I'm sure that there was some meaning. Like, someone talked, there was a discussion about these, you know, and there's a reason for it. There's an entire book written about it that I've never read by Leo Steinberg, uh, called The Sexuality of Christ. It's super bizarre. But the, the point is that now, after time has passed, the misinterpretation of what he was talking about, of what they were talking about, is uh, it's just palpable. Like, I'm pretty sure it wasn't like Beavis and Butthead jokes or graffiti or... I'm sure there was a reason for it, but now it's just so strange. I don't have much to say about it, just how bizarre it is that meaning, whatever it was, whatever the reason was, has changed over time. And so that this led into my, I mean, this is part of my idea about what art can do. This is Bernini's sculpture of the ecstasy of St. Teresa. And it's pretty, you know, straightforward, like uh, God delivering a message to St. Teresa. But a lot of people have noticed that the arrow is going right to her crotch and the look on her face is something like orgasmic. And it's, I'm pretty sure that's not meant to be, when it was made, it probably wasn't meant to convey that specific message in a church. You know, that's, but the fact that it's, uh, it's wobbly territory now after the passage of time and how it can have multiple meanings and you know, be outside of whatever religious context, I find endless, endlessly interesting. All right, so let's get into early work. I'm gonna start, uh, this is kind of when I moved to New York in 1999. I was, went to undergrad in Austin. I moved to New York and I was just painting in my apartment, just had a tiny apartment. And this is a period of where I, I was really, like a lot of people I visited today, concerned with, uh, narrative and meaning and I, I just I, it had to have a story so I'm not going to go into every every thing that I know I mean I know the most about this stuff but I, I think um, I think you get it it's like a guy is overwhelmed I actually knew this guy he's a comedian now in LA but he was very overwhelmed by life you know and it's kind of took the form of these books it's very literal it's very like one plus one but it had to also have this like strange third thing. So I had to have a starting point, like something I was talking about. 
and then it had to have an injected weirdness. That was my idea of, of what to do at this point. Um, I started to get into, uh, I've always been into it. I still do it. I try to hide it more now because I think it's a fun game. But um, taking a reference, like an art historical reference, and then coding it, uh, hiding it, concealing it enough to where you make it yours. So this is pretty straightforward, taken from an old ship print book. I don't even know who this was, but um, just intervening in it, like these floating figures in cages. It was a very flat, you know, the space that the ship print depicted was very flat, and I thought, just at a dumb level, just make it spatial. So I did this perspective-y intervention. It's another one, ship print. Started to mix periods of art, quoting an old thing with like a Richter scrape, like a Gerhardt Richter scrape move that was propelling the ship, you know, art ideas. Um, Bryce marred me, you know, kind of like lines crossing over this, <clears throat> excuse me, the lines, the graphic lines, which this is kind of a dark slide, but they actually come from some of the mustaches of some of the figures. So it's like, it's a line, but it's also, it's a graphic line, but it's also a physical thing in the space. So this is, uh, you know, this is work I was making in New York at the time. This is a direct quote of a Bellini painting that I love. It's one of my favorite paintings in New York. Mine's terrible. It's very small. It's a very fast painting. But the, the thing I was trying to do is like removing the religious kind of, I could remove the content. I was, it was a game I was playing where you remove the content, the original content, in the way that those Cronach paintings, I think that some meaning has shifted over time and some reading of them, the way they're understood. And so if I remove St. Francis from the painting, then I could play this game of like, how much can this structure stand and uh, still be felt as an image, still be, still be uh, an emotional delivery device, which, you know, a few more of these. This is taken from a Poussin painting, and this is like a gouache on paper, 40 inches, but it, it you know, it's the, this painting, pretty, pretty directly obscured hidden, sources hidden. And that led to this painting, which was large, about 66 inches tall, and that's them together. So you could even, the thing about some old master paintings is they have so much compositional integrity that you could, you could flip them on their side, upside down. And they could withstand a lot of, a lot of uh, abuse and quoting. the Bellini painting. I started, I also, you know, it never ends, like you think about, um, this is a period where I was really out, like I had no ideas, you know, just like nothing was coming just out of nothing. Nothing was coming from my studio practice, so I was just borrowing. This one I, I thought about, you know, the violence that's depicted in the painting is, you know, in a jokey, <clears throat> winking way, repeated in the violence, the so-called violence of abstraction you know, that's a, a trope of, of painting. It's a quote from Piero della Francesca. This is, a, this is like kind of taking volumetric ideas of bodies and replacing them mass for mass, uh, you know, weight for weight with objects similarly scaled and, and you know, Jesus, baby Jesus is a couple of foot pedals, guitar pedals. Yeah. Made sense. A few more. St. Sebastian. You know, if you took, if you took St. Sebastian, who's a martyr, who, you know, withstood being shot with arrows without complaining or, or giving up his belief or faith, if you put scaffolding around the body and protected the body from the the violation, uh, the violence, you know, does it retain the meaning? Is the composition enough to withhold the power? All right, so this project trailed off, and this is, you know, kind of a visual depiction of that moment, kind of a, 
a boredom and a, a, lost, a lostness. This is me in New York. And I was about to leave New York for like a year to go back to Austin to kind of get really into the studio practice so that I could apply to grad school. I went to grad school very late. That's another thing I, we could talk about if we end up talking about it. But I uh, it was almost like it was like a 13 year break between undergrad and grad school. And I had to do it. Like I couldn't have gone uh, any earlier, but I needed that whole time to kind of not only develop an intense studio practice, but to kind of really have uh, a direction, I would say. So this is probably the last painting I did before I went to grad school. And uh, this was probably 2006. And it ended up being like my, I didn't know it at the time, but it was like my 9-11 painting, I guess. And I, it was something about, you know, it was, it was still attached to this, like a painting has to be at least in some part front loaded with meaning. Like you have to have something you're talking about to lead you, you know, that's the only way to make images. And so this is like a, a real cynical, like the Bush administration, you know, kind of putting on a laser light show on a site of rubble and destruction to kind of uh, misdirect any attention or questions. So I was really still thinking about this way, kind of an illustrator's way of, of painting. And uh, this was probably the very last painting. This is the painting I did right before um, I was at Skowhegan, which is an art residency in Maine, which uh, kind of changed everything for me. I started painting differently. This is invented. It's basically a self-portrait, but it's an invented image. And I thought of uh, turning myself into like a cave painter, like something just what I imagined to be a very base level of like no knowledge of, of contemporary art, no nothing, you know, even though this probably seemed contemporary to me at the time as well, but it was just like about a dumb head, like just reduced to a dumb head and just, I was really uh, preempting the stress for, that I was about to enter into grad school probably. All right, now I'm gonna show, this is, this is a pretty standard process. This is one of my paintings in, from beginning to end. Um, this would be like a thumb, this is tiny, this is like, you know, two inch drawing, just a scribble on a, on a, <clears throat> on a piece of paper. That is, a cent the only idea I had was that I wanted a painting of a horse's ass. Like, uh, you know those Uccello, Uccello paintings? Those really weird paintings where that horse is like kicking and you see it from the back, they're bizarre foreshortened horse. So my idea was that uh, the space of a painting all took place over the back of a horse, you know, and it all kinds of, I guess I'm lying, like I still front load paintings with ideas, like I still have ideas, but the thing is I let go of them whenever I need to and you'll, you'll see. So the whole joke about, I don't know if there's any horse people in the room, but like you're not supposed to stand right behind a horse or that's like a, a, a myth, I don't know if it's a myth. Horses can kick you, that's the point. So it's like you're standing in front of a painting that is a back of a horse, and if you're aware of that, it's one of the thoughts you'll have. So that's, this is a jump, you know? So it goes from a drawing like that, to this, to this. It's all the same thing, you know, if you really, and you'll see in the painting. So then the painting starts, it's terrible, it's awful colors. I like to start a painting with really hideous colors goes to this, I'm, you know, I'm just going along. I don't, I'm just gonna go through these. I don't know if you can see it in the background, those gray things that are in the back space. Those are like rodeo horses. I had no idea, those weren't in the original drawing. So the horse is still there at that point, but there's holes in it for some reason. I don't really know why. It's like, so you could enter the space. The horse was blocking too much. So I started to hack away at that, it's still developing, completely lost, canceling out a bunch of, I also used to think you couldn't take a painting, I talked about this today, you couldn't make a painting dark and then ever bring it back to, to something that you could put bright colors on. It's not true, you can always do that. You can always, you can always save any painting. I, I never throw paintings away. So then dirtying it up again, cleaning it up again, almost wrecking it, and then finding this. 
So I don't have anything between, this is like one crazy day of painting, so I don't have any in between photos between those two things. And then that's the final painting. So, you know, you can, you can figure from the beginning of that painting, almost has nothing, the drawings have almost nothing to do with this painting, but I had to do it, you know, I had to go with all of that mess, and not every painting goes to do that, but I'd say, you know, three out of every five paintings have to go through something like that. All right, now these aren't in chronological order. I've kind of put these in uh, categories of like heads, objects, landscapes, I'm not sure, but this, this is like the head section. So, um, and these are chronologically mashed up. I care a lot about titles, but I also don't care if, you know, not everyone reads the titles. But because I don't always know what the things are that are in the little drawings, the little doodles, I'm often, you know, lost in uh, nameability at some point. I, I'm like, I don't know what it is, and then because I'm willing to change it in the middle, um, I kind of like, uh, I'm open to the name coming, and when the name comes to me towards some, in some part of making it, uh, that helps me finish the painting, usually, coming up with the title. I'll also do this every once in a while, where I'll do two paintings that are the same thing. So this is the same as this. Two different paintings, two different meanings, hopefully. I don't, have, I don't have something to say about every one of these. But, you know, some of them are, some of them are pretty uh, inside jokes. Like I remember, this is after I saw um, one of the Matthew Barney movies. I can't remember which, Crime Master, Crime Master. But I called this painting Crime Master, you know, because it's a bunch of eyes. And I, it was just, it was that word, Crime Master. And I, I, like, I don't know, I was doodling this head it had a lot of eyes and I just cry master and it just made me make the painting. It's not like it's some, uh, yeah, I, and I don't, I don't really know what it, it's cartoon, cartoony head with a bunch of eyes. But for something, I had to notate the like feeling of like making fun of Matthew Barney without really making fun of Matthew Barney. It's called mustache rack. You know, it came, it came late, the, the mustaches in this structure came at the end, you know, it just was this thing, I was just building this thing out of paint. And I didn't know what it, what it was for, or what it was, and it's just, I mean, there's no such thing as a mustache rack, there's no need for it, but it, it, made, it made me uh, finish the painting, it made sense in the moment, and I kind of, it, it fit there, it made sense. Another head. <clears throat> There's a, let's see. And I don't see any difference between like a head or an, or a, an object or, a, I mean, I've, this, these didn't start out as heads, even one that's more, identifiable as a human head. It didn't really start out as a head. This was probably, uh, from one of the drawings, it was probably a, a thing, more than a head. And it just, the painting dictated that it became a head. Um, there's, a, there's a writer that I like, um, Richard Schiff. He's like an art writer. I think he's a big Cezanne expert or something. And uh, he's written Peter Doig forwards to his book. But he has this, it was in an interview, but it, I think he's written about it. He has this line of talking about um, what art can do, what, what we look for, and he, and he talks about everything from a dumb object in the world, and, and I think he meant, he kind of meant like a rock, like you're walking around in the desert and you find an interesting rock, and you can pick up this rock, and you can have a moment, a subjective experience with a rock, or a stick or something, and like you can't get any dumber than that object. It's been made by passive, active forces. It's been passive. And uh, he says if a, if a dumb object can do that, then something like a painting can put you in that scenario in spades, like that subjective experience. A painting that's been touched, 
and worked on, changed. And uh, I, I think about that all the time, that, that idea of like, you don't, have to, you don't have to know all the time what it is or where you're going. You just have to be engaged with the object, you know, and that's how I, that's how I treat it. Although I have my taste, I can't escape my taste. I'm kind of a, a super fan of, uh, of a lot of different styles of art, I would say. Like this painting to this painting, you know. It's like trying to do some kind of realistic hair here and then trying to do like a flattened out, uh, minimal information um, kind of graphic description of something. To me, they're the same like they're the same thing, it's just uh, this called for, you know, some kind of jokey, surrealistic, floppy guitar stock and bass guitar. Back to kind of like a depiction of drapery, you know, this came out of nowhere. So I'm just gonna cycle through some of these images that I don't have. Once again, if you have any questions of any of these, yell it out. Yes. Yep. By languages, you mean uh, style of painting or, um, yeah. Well, that's the thing, I mean, I kind of, uh, I may be more open to that than some people. I just feel, I feel like it's whatever's useful. You know, I mean, if, if uh, I don't know if I have any examples, but if it's like painting to me is more like collage. I mean, my paintings don't look like collage and they don't, they don't feel like collage when you see them in person. They're like very, they hold together as one surface, I think. But if two disparate styles would help me describe something that I'm trying to describe, you know, that comes from a drawing that has very limited information, then I, I would gladly deploy, you know, thick paint next to thin, uh, darkness next to brightness, you know, I would do, I would do any of it. I, uh, I, don't, I just need it to hold together, I don't know. I, I'm just attracted to different, I'm allergic to familiarity, I think, you know, in general, in, in art and in my, own, in my own work. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Anyone else? I heard someone else. That, that was the idea, but it didn't. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, Jaya asked me if I started making sculptures in order to paint them. And uh, yeah, that was the idea. It was to use sculptures as a drawing. Right, and it was that idea of the backside being like the thing that you can't get, you can't invent that. It just happens because I don't know how to make sculpture, and so it'd be it would be the kind of strangeness that I'm always trying to produce, you know, methodically, like drawing and then painting from the drawing, squeezing enough information out of you know a couple of lines to make it uh, complicated but simple. But yeah, the scope, that was the original idea, and it, it didn't work that way. I've never done it. So now they just sit around, they hang out, I show them every once in a while. Uh, yeah, I wish there were two of me. I would just make sculpture too, you know, on the side, like the whole way. This is like, this is one of my favorite weird, like it's a, it's a looking into a studio, you know, you're kind of looking through. I do a lot of images that are about looking through, past something, looking through something, and this one is, a, the hole in the studio wall or whatever, you're looking into a studio, and the hole of the wall is a palette, like an old-fashioned painter's palette, and then you're looking at a palette. It's the kind of flat-footed joke that I don't think, uh, it doesn't read as a joke because I don't think it's really clear what it is, but to me it just gets me motivated to like make this painting. Like I came, I was, I was very happy when I came up with this image. Once again, I mean, every one of these has, you know, I could, I could go into each painting, but I, I don't think it's, um, 
Yeah, I don't, I don't have something to say about all of them except that uh, they're just in the mix. You know, we'll see. We'll see at the end of, uh, I'd like to see them all together. You know, that'd be interesting someday. I guess that's what we're doing, but. I can't really make sense of all of them, you know, and it's that kind of, uh, because of that idea of misinterpretation being such uh, a way that I came to think about art, whether it's taking Star Wars in a direction that I don't know if it was supposed to be used for, or my idea of religious art, which was one of the hugest influences. That and like Norman Rockwell, I think that was my idea of art. And Frederick Remington, do people even talk about Frederick Remington anymore? Like Western art of cowboys. I'll also do something that feels like kind of, I talk about it in studios today, you're, you're gonna hear me repeat myself, but like a spectrum of uh, like high and low or like one end of the spectrum and the other. And like if I do a painting like this, like a, a hot colored, high keyed kind of um, cartoony, grotesque painting. I'll do a painting like this, which is like more like austere, or I, th I think of it as that way, kind of like more classic, or you know, I'll try to test my, my sensibility a little bit. This is one of those paintings that just lasted way too long, and the image was uh, just completely obliterated out of frustration. Like I just completely, what is, you know, Portland gray, this color that's like colorful gray. I just canceled out the whole painting and it was better. And then I just drew back into it, kind of a little, little lines here and they're treated it like a drawing. And I thought I was gonna throw this one away and it came back at the last minute. It's, uh, that happens again and again and it, yeah, just, on the one hand, it makes you work on a few paintings too long, but on the other hand, you get some real gems that, that could have been uh, discarded. I really like to pack, I don't know if you can tell, I like to pack a lot of images into a slide talk, so it's like, like 100 images, sorry, bombarding your eyeballs. And if I do like a colorful one, I'll do one that's uh, kind of, stripped of color. I'll kind of, that allergic to familiarity thing extends to like, I try to, I don't have a, I think I have one studio shot, but it's only of two larger ones. But in general, my studio is clogged with uh, paintings everywhere and I can see everything at once, kind of. It's kind of like a confusing, but what it does do is it, it kind of keeps me from repeating myself a little bit which I really, I don't want to repeat myself within at least the body of work. Like I just try to, try to keep it diverse and uh, still hold together as like one hand made these things. This is my big uh, atheist painting here. It's called Schmevelations. And it's, uh, that's God coming down and uh, God being very confused. This is my most cartoony illustrative uh, recent painting. And it's like God seeing all the religious texts and just very confused about what, what, what she said before, you know? Like, did I say that? And uh, yeah, it's very cartoony. And once again, like, I don't think that is a direct, I don't think you're gonna come to this painting and get that, like, it's not gonna hit you. But to me, it gets me, you know, it gets me to, like, I understand the painting once I have that in my head. Schmevelations. This one's called 10, it just looks like 10. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what this, uh, this structure is, this thing, and it's why, um, it's probably why I started making the sculptures because I, I thought like each one of these things could be a thing. Like I'm while I'm painting it, I'm building it also. I'm thinking, you know, even if it, insists on its frontal flatness. Like they, you know, it hints at perspective. It goes back about, you know, eight inches or whatever the space is that it takes up. 
And these are, these are like, uh, I could put a couple big ones here in a row. It's like 80 inches. And that brown, kind of the object itself is, uh, this is, I don't know if I got this from you, Jaya, or if I did this after, but the, the brown part of this image is raw canvas, like it's untouched. So this is something I would never do because what that did is it uh, prevented me from ever changing my mind. So all the, all the, that's why it's so frenetic around the object because I couldn't paint on the, the linen. It was just, yes. Yeah, I care about it. I mean, I, I wouldn't let it stop me from doing something to a painting. But uh, yeah, I care about it. I mean, I, I want these things to last um, until I'm dead. But then, uh, but no, I, I, I think they're fine. I'm painting pretty thinly. You know, there's, there's a few times where there's a lot of paint, but that's always at the end when I know, I know what's going on. But yeah, there's no, like I've never had a painting crack. I've never had any weirdness, you know. Oh, the, all those changes. Yeah, if you saw the painting at every stage, it's like, I don't know, like it's not that thick. There's not a lot of thick paint. In the end, it has some real body, but uh, it's only because it went through, you know, all those changes. But yeah, at no point was it like gloppy, you know? Yeah, no problems yet. This is my uh, Hurricane Sandy painting. This is my, I was in, my studio was in Red Hook. Um, in Brooklyn, and there was something, yeah, I don't know, there was something about, it's called Storm Kings, so it's like a, I don't know, these two uh, mythological creatures not moving while the flood was coming in. It's like a nice, I really liked that bicycle seat to the left, that was my favorite thing, and a mustache floating in the water, it makes no sense. Big one. You know, and it, like this is a good example of like one that's a, it's a thing, but it's also a head. You know, I just, I think of this as a head. You know, it's not that. Sometimes you, you take it in and out of being a head just to figure it out structurally. Same thing. Question? Yes. Wait, if we have a question, we have it under the microphone. Oh. Oh, we're, we can do it after, too. I mean, uh, yeah. That's the official. All right. So a lot of your paintings seem to be pretty playful. Do you have to do things to, like, actively keep the play and the humor alive? Like, in your studio practice, do you, like, work towards that? I mean, that, that's all, that's good luck when it, when it remains playful. I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, I think humor and uh, <clears throat> even weirdness is like that for me. It's like the, I mean, I use that word, and I don't know what that, it's weird, like I try to keep it weird. And by that, I just mean, I wanna be excited about the idea, like I don't know what it is. Like I get excited when I'm, I'm like, I can almost figure it out, but I haven't figured it out. So yeah, I try to be, if I could make really funny um, paintings, that would be the best, you know. Like, I, I love Peter Saul paintings. I don't think they're funny. I think they're, they're weird. You know Peter Saul? I don't know. I think of people that are like, make funny things, and I, I don't know how to make a funny painting, but I, I do think about it a lot, yeah. Funny is, I can change it out with weird, so I just, I don't know if, that answer, if that's what you mean. Like, if I could come up with an idea that I, that I think is clever, I guess, then that would be the high, one of the highest things I could do. But when they get into territory of like describing something that I don't know, I don't know what kind of humor I'd be transferring, but I'm glad that they feel like kind of like playful, or if that's another word that's switchable with humor, yeah. that one again. This is a really fast one. This is a new thing for me. I'm going to show you. Um, <clears throat> we're at the 38 minute mark. I'm going to make it. I'm going to, I'm going to really speed towards the end here. I like a 45 minute talk. I don't know what you're used to. But um, this is a really fast one for me. Like this took uh, no time at all. I mean this is like a painting that is a drawing. And you know I had a drawing like this. 
And I made this painting with the idea that's the same as all my paintings, that I'm just gonna keep going. This can't be the thing. I did it in one session, uh, that's unacceptable. Uh, just in my psyche, it's like, that's not a thing. But I couldn't move on, I couldn't touch it, I couldn't change it. I did a, a copy of it just so that I wouldn't destroy it. And uh, I really just never could move on it. And I, it's, I really like this painting. And uh, it's, uh, it was a doodle. And it, when, I, when I finished it after looking at it for weeks and weeks, I realized it was essentially the structure or the narrative of Goya's painting, Saturn devouring his son, you know, this painting. It's like a, a giant figure like biting the head off of another uh, body. It's like super violent. And uh, once again, it's like, it's not like, a, it wasn't a quote because I didn't have it in my head when I did it, but that painting's in my head somewhere. Like, I like that painting. But the thing that, the thing that I liked about it is it was a fast painting that I could not, I could not say that I could improve it with more work. So <clears throat> the rest of my talk wouldn't show this, but I don't think labor for labor's sake is interesting for anyone. And I would never tell anyone that, you know, you just haven't put enough hours in. Like if, if you can hit it like the first time, if you can get lucky, you know, definitely take that luck. There's another, this is a slow fast, and this is a fake fast one. There's a lot of painting underneath that one. But it's a weird one. No one likes this painting, but I like it. It's, a, it's not, yeah, there's something about it not depicting figure ground, like it's just one, people, it's hard to see or something. I don't know, I kept trying, I keep trying, I'm still doing it, trying to make a painting that is, uh, has what a drawing has. And I, I don't know, I don't know what it is. So this is like more of a, this is like a drawing that's been erased, you know, is how I think of it. Okay, let me get through these. I'm gonna show you some more very recent kind of what's in the studio coming up. These are pretty recent. <clears throat> there is a tendency towards these last ones. The, the, I was speeding up, like these are all faster paintings. But I have done the thing where like I take one of these fast ones, like that Saturn, Saturn devouring his son painting, and I hang it next to the, the most laborious, uh, ridiculous one. And it's, it has to, they have to play nice together. They have to make sense. And if they can do that, then I would gladly make fast paintings. This is a big one. Then I don't. I was thinking of a, a Prince album cover, uh, 1999. You know this album cover? It has all these colors and kind of like, it's a very cartoony, like a child drew it, you know? But it had these colors and it's a sim similar thing. Like I wasn't looking at the album cover, but it occurred to me while I was making this painting that I was basically trying to make a Prince album cover if he was a, a acid casualty. I don't know what it, what it would be. Okay, so we're almost at the end here. This, these are new ones, so I don't, I don't really understand these yet. I don't know what they are. This is a tiny painting. So this is probably closer to like trying to make fast paintings. And this is what's going on now. So um, I'm as confused as, as uh, as I could be on some of these. These are still ongoing. A little different. And these are two, so the, this is the last image, <clears throat> but these are like two big ones that are like that might not even be anywhere in the final painting, but that's just how I started, you know, and I have drawings of both of those things and they might end up in the final painting in some way or they might be totally obliterated. But when you have a big blank thing in your studio, the best thing is to just uh, take that blankness off and do something to it. 
Um, that's it. I'm open for questions. Anything? Anything? <laughs> Thanks. Forty-three minutes. Is that a is that a standard Jaya? What what's the usual? Yeah, great. It's polite. People have things to do. Uh, I have a couple questions, so I'll just kind of um, try to put them together. Uh, one of them that was coming up while I was watching the slideshow of yours is trying to put together how much time had lapsed in the works and whether the works had any if you linked them in any specific way, like was it, was it somewhat sequential? Or I guess maybe you said it was something about like heads and other shapes. How, how I showed them was it sequential? Yeah. Yeah, no, it wasn't. It was kind of category of more like shapes. But uh, right. in general, uh, all of the images um, after the first going to New York stuff was from the past uh, five years or so. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's give some kind of frame yeah. for like right. the production and the time is right. what we're looking I at. I mean, as far as production, there's no regularity. I mean, like I said, that one was like a one day thing, a one day studio thing. And the one that I showed all the changes, that was over a year. I would never recommend it, but that's what it, that's what it was. Jai, you would never recommend that either. Yeah, yeah. There's actually a great book. I don't know if people hate John Curran everywhere in the world, but there's a great book he put out on one painting, and I think he painted on it for like two years, and it's just one book about one painting. Has anyone seen this? It's really good. And the last page is something like, uh, don't ever do that. It's a bad <laughs> idea. I have a second question, which has to do with, because you are making lots of changes in the paintings, and yep. I see many layers, almost printmaking-like, uh, but there's something that feels a race and almost not just overpainting, but maybe even sanding or taking things away. Yeah. Are you using some m I, more aggressive techniques? To I don't make sand. That? Yeah, I don't. I don't sand anything. It's it's usually just um, it's a certain type of touch, I guess. Like just I have a con I definitely have tools and tricks and things, but I'll like sparsely put paint over an image that I want to just, I call it fuzzing it out or something. And then I'll like scrape it with like a dumb trowel, like a cement trowel tool or something. Not to like really abrade the, the surface, but just to move the paint around. And uh, yeah, I often will fuzz an image out and then bring it back, kind of to test if, if it really wanted to be there or something. You know? <laughs> So this leads into another question, which is surface. Do you start always, are you always using linen or are you using different fabrics to get the different textures? Is yeah, I like, linen come into it? I like linen for a really dumb reason, or maybe it's not, I don't know. I love the sides of linen paintings, like just that beautiful brown side. That's really it. Like the surface is primed enough to where it could be regular canvas or whatever, <laughs> but I, I'm just a fetishy about the side of paintings. I tape them off, keep them very clean. Thanks. Yep. I forgot to say something about, I mean, this might, this is a whole nother talk, but a lot of people worry about meaning, you know, like meaning in, in painting and being like, kind of like, I guess I did address it with like the, the misinterpretation over time or whatever. But my feeling about um, art doing the work of like direct communication and and standing up for uh, values and showing our politics. I think if it leads to good ideas, it's like really interesting. But uh, I kind of think it doesn't really function that way. And I, I feel that way because my politics are, I'm, I pay attention, I kind of, I'm not an activist, I don't do anything active really, I can't claim to do that. But I care a lot about it and, and I still make the kind of work I make because I feel like the way that I misinterpret meaning over time, I think it's a weirder communication. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say. One and I do support, like, I'm all for a society that would permit me to do that, you know? That's kind of a society that would tolerate an artist like me, like I really do believe in. And so if that comes through in the work, that's good, but, you know, I don't know. I just thought I'd say that. That was a big conversation in some of the studios, I think, today.
mening. I'm from Hello. Austin, too. Or I'm from Portland, Texas, and Austin. And, nice. Okay. Huh. Portland, Texas, where is that? Right outside of Corpus. Yes, um, Port. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know who your, you talked about your past influences, um, but who your influences are now and what artists you're looking at now. Every, you know, a lot. I mean, I, um, I mean, there's influences that are, you know, in the art world that are like people I don't know, but I mean, I was lucky enough to go to the grad program I went to and be in New York for enough time. I mean, a huge influence on me that is nothing like my work really, but process-wise, Charlene von Heil is a New York painter, German New York painter, that um, just the kind of uh, attitude she has about making something is one of my favorite things I've ever encountered, big influence. But also just my friends. I mean, I have a lot of very rigorous artist friends. I mean, I was talking earlier to Mark about it's hard to recommend New York these days because it's so expensive and it's hard. it hates artists, basically. The studios are terrible. But it's still where a lot of artists are hanging out. It's a lot of, a lot of good conversations. So. Yeah, too many to mention. I like, I like a lot of everything. I like stuff that's nothing like my stuff. I like stuff that like, I wish I had made, you know. I like video art. Hey, I was wondering if you ever worry about how your uh, works function less individually but more as a whole in a, a general meaning, because I noticed that they, uh, I don't want to say eclectic, but you, you follow your mind and you follow your train of thoughts, and not everybody can necessarily pick up on that. Right. I don't worry about it, no. I mean, <clears throat> and I think you nailed it in the question. I mean, I kind of think about my idea of art, another idea of art is like, ex like encountering it in the world, you know, which I love. I mean, I've been lucky enough to see art in places where people live, you know, really amazing art in homes. And not to mention museums. You know, if you go to a museum and there's like one, you only get one Piero della Francesca. That's all you get, you know? It's like it doesn't get its buddies around it. It's just one thing. It's like it has to, it has to stand for all of Piero della Francesca, you know? So that's my idea of my own work. Like I want them to be autonomous. I want them to stand up to scrutiny from all time. You know, it's like an absurd um, desire, but it's the way I think about it. And eclectic groupings are some of my favorite groupings, you know? So it's like, that's, I like my shows to feel that way. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know, it's just a, I can't help it. That's what I like, yeah. Uh, and one more thing, how do you, uh, on the opposite side, how do you feel like your work has changed? and not seeing it necessarily chronologically, like seeing that, that God reading the book painting. Yeah. Uh, that, that threw like a very pretty wrench in everything. Yeah, that, see that was, uh, what was that? That was, I think that was from 2012. You know, it feels recent to me. I was like, pretty recent. And I feel like there's this idea, this recent idea of fast, like uh, making one fast, or just, even if I don't do it, the idea of, of touching something differently or like trying to make a fast painting. I mean, I think that was a pretty fast painting. So I don't even think of that as like cartoony, even though I recognize that it. it's cartoony, it's, I, it's nameable. I titled it so that you would maybe get it. But to me, there's no difference between one that I totally don't understand. You know, it's like the same thing. That's, I don't know, it's an unsatisfactory answer, but. Yeah, I don't mind if it's like completely like, hey, you did this, uh, you can't do that. It's like, yeah, I can, I can totally do that. Um, so you said before that like, you mentioned a lot of art historical references. So do you think that your friend's artwork, like who you say you look at now, does that influence your work as much as art history did? Oh yeah, yeah, and you know, when your friends 
change what they're doing and you get to see it like in the middle, like in a weird studio visit, you're like, oh, like kind of like that, like, oh, you're not doing the thing. Like, don't give up the thing that you do. Like, it's unbelievable. You're putting that on the table and doing this other thing. But I don't know, all that's, all that's really useful and exciting and inspiring and I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's cool that, I mean, I've been lucky enough to like some people that I, I saw their art when I first moved to New York are now people that I know, some of them, you know? I mean, it's kind of really fun and yeah, it's great. And a lot of influences in, in people that I can call, you know? And I have one more like totally formal question. Um, how do you think the grid functions in your work? Because I've, I've seen the, it a lot. The what? The grid. The grid, yes. <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think I understand how it functions. On the one hand, it's like an art history, like uh, what Matisse quote or something. And on the other hand, it functions in the way that he or other people have made it function to where it just, it shows you like a, a flat space that takes you past an object. That's a, it's a sign for space that stops, you know. It insists on flatness, but it still describes space. So it's like a funny, it's just one of those things that's in our brains, our monkey brains. Like we just, under, we see it, we know it, you know. I don't know. Yeah. I have a question about color. Um, color. So you start out with this kind of skeleton drawing, really quick doodle. Right. It's very inventive. It, does color happen in the same way? Or, because you have a really specific palette, so. Yeah. I mean, it's worked, it works every kind of way. I mean, I feel like um, <clears throat> people think that I'm like, uh, I don't have any control over color. Like, I, I'm not the type of person that's like, I know that all these colors go together and I just know how to mix them and then I just make the painting. I treat the color in the same way I do imagery. It's like I find it. It's like I get lost. I mean, I do grift. I, I would shortcut it if I could. Like I look at a painting that I like, an old idea, and just take all those colors and just use them. And it rarely works. You know, it's like, oh, this is just different proportions. It's like it's not the same. Something's off. But you know, some colors work with other colors always, and I like I I think what I try to do consciously is make odd color combos, and you know, try to make it a little off, you know, just because it's interesting in the way that off subjects are interesting. Or, yeah, so it's found, it's it's excavate, it's like yeah, experimental. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, that's Thanks. great.